Please bow and pray with me. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Show us the way. For we know you do this through your proclaimed word. Now give us ears to hear that we would not only see your light, but it would guide us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Turn with me to the book of Lamentations, preferably in your Bible. The bulletin will suffice. I got permission from the bishop to deviate from the lectionary. We're going to be spending the next five Sundays looking at the book of Lamentations. Now, I'm not going to ask you, but uh, just think, um, are there a lot of people that study in depth the book of Lamentations? Probably not. But I do think that this study is going to be very rewarding because you have to ask yourself, and I do say as a preacher, this is not an easy passage to preach through. But you have to ask, why did God put this in the Bible? Was it an accident? No, I don't think so. I think he has a, an important word for us, and especially as we enter into this season. And what is the season that we are entering into? And you'll notice some change of color. Lent. And what do we do during the season of Lent? Repent. We look at the sin in our lives. Perhaps we ask God to reveal it because we're not so good at seeing it. We can see other people's sin. We can spot that from like 100 miles away. But when it comes to our own sin, well, that's complicated. But in the season of Lent, it's where we slow down and we say, wait a second. What am I not seeing that everyone else can see so clearly? And so with that, we turn to Lamentations, which is very much about not only recognizing your sin, but God's just judgment for that sin. And so turn with me now to Lamentations 1, and I will start in the very first verse. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How, how like a widow has she become. She who was great among the nations. She who was a princess among the provinces is now a slave. Do you, do you see the title that I have uh, in the bulletin? You're thinking, well, Matt, he messed up. That's not a title. And yet, do you know what the title of the book we're studying is? Literally, in English, it's how. That's what Lamentations is. How sorrowful is the state of Israel. How sorrowful will they become? Lamentations tells the sad story of what happens to those who rebel against God. What could possibly happen, though, if we rebel against God? That's what I think our culture wants to say. You know, we look at laws, and, you know, laws are, you know, relative. Do we really need to follow them? Will they really hurt us if we break these laws? So let's go down this path for a moment. What happens if you try to break the law of gravity? How is that going to go for you? What if you decide, you know, I've always wanted to touch fire. I'm just going to tell my brain that fire is not going to hurt when I touch it. I've always wanted to put my hands into the, the fireplace. Let's just see how this goes for a moment. In a very similar way, we can think to ourselves, will anything really happen to me if I disobey God? Lamentations answer is a resounding yes. In fact, it is composed of five separate poems that go into great lengths to discuss the consequences of disobeying God. Look at your Bibles or your bulletins and tell me how many verses are in the first chapter. We, we read the first chapter, and thank you, Buzzy, for reading through that. But how many verses are in the first chapter? If you look at chapters 2 and 4 and 5, Guess how many verses there are? 22. Why? Well, how many letters are in the Hebrew alphabet? 22. But you'll say, but Matt, chapter 3 is a juggernaut. That's 66 verses. 
they take three verses per one vowel or one letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so what's three times 22? 66. And it's the pinnacle. It really is the bright part of the whole book. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. We're in chapter 1. And what we see from A to Z or from Aleph to Tav, Lamentations gives us the ABCs of the consequences of sin. Lamentations is God's gracious way of encouraging us to follow him, much like we as parents would encourage our our children not to touch a hot stove. And as we turn to Lamentations 1, we are going to find three things. We're going to see Jerusalem's devastation, Jerusalem's cry for help, and then finally, Jerusalem's God. So first, Jerusalem's devastation. Verses 8 and 9 sum up well the condition of God's people. Jerusalem sinned grievously, therefore she became filthy. All who honored her despise her, for they have seen her nakedness. She herself groans and turns her face away. Her uncleanness was in her skirts. She took no thought of her future, therefore her fall is terrible. She has no comforter. The author is likening Israel's sin to that of the marriage relationship between Hosea and Gomer. You all know the the story, the the prophecy of Hosea? You recall Gomer in that book of the Bible, that prophecy, she symbolized Israel, and she was not faithful to her husband, Hosea. No, she became like a prostitute, and she went after a whole lot of different lovers. And lovers is used there as well as here. What does it mean by lovers? Well, it means gods and governments. What was happening? Israel was going after the gods and the governments of the surrounding nations. That's what we see. Those are the other other lovers that Israel was going after. Now, we discussed this last week. Remember Ahab and Jezebel? Do you remember what they did in in Israel? He he was the king of uh, of northern Israel. And what did he and Jezebel do? but establish the worship of Baal throughout the land. What were they doing? Well, they were going after other lovers. They were breaking their covenant relationship with Yahweh, that is, the God of Israel. What we learned last week and what we're going to learn in our time in Lamentations is that it might seem like God is doing nothing. You know, we sin and we're like, is something going to happen? And we think, oh, well, nothing at all. But in actuality, one of the worst things that God can do to us is give us everything that we want. And in fact, judgment begins to come upon us when it happens. And when God's judgment comes, it's horrible so much that we will not be able to bear it. And that's the imagery of the widow saying, I have no comforter. And this is what we see in verses 11 through 12. All her people groan as they search for bread. They trade their treasures for food to revive their strength. Look, O Lord, and see, for I am despised. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. We must remember that God had brought Israel out of captivity of, you know, captivity to Egypt and into the promised land. And now he's taking them out of the land of the promise. And he is sending them back into captivity. Why? What could possibly cause them to turn away from their Lord? Well, we must never underestimate the power and the influence of culture. Do you realize that, I mean, everything, even your interpretation of Scripture, is influenced by the culture in which you live? This is not in the passage, but I want you to understand something. I think this is so important. There are, um, there's a battle going on right now, and it's a battle of stories. Which story is true? Which makes most sense of what we are experiencing in this life? Is it the Christian story, the story of Christ, or for us Westerners, is it the Enlightenment? Is it materialism? Is all there is to life just the material world, and we're here by accident, by happenstance. Those are the two stories, and I would put to you that the, the materialist story does not hold a candle to the story of Jesus Christ, and that's what we're looking at today. 
And this is the power of culture, though. Even though this is true, it will still influence us. And I had this experience shortly after I moved to the South. Some of you know that I'm from Iowa. I'm not from uh, the South. And shortly after I got here, I was having a phone conversation with one of my friends from Iowa, David Davenport. And uh, we're talking on the phone, and he stops me. He says, Matt, why are you talking like that? I said, talking like what? (laughs) And you know what I was doing? I was using the little phrases. Yeah, someone just said, y'all. You're using the little words, the nuances. And he could note, and he's like, what in the world has happened to you? And I didn't even recognize it. But you see, it's more than just the language that the culture influences, doesn't it? We watch our culture's movies. We read its magazines. We go to its academies. We listen to its politics, don't we? And before long, guess what happens to us? We begin to think just like our culture. And if we're not focused on Christ, and we're not being transformed by Christ, we will become transformed by the culture because we are focused upon it. God's people, Israel, became seduced by the surrounding cultures. And their pursuit of other lovers led to Jerusalem's devastation in 587 B.C. When Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was leveled, and its people were deported into exile. And this devastation then led to our second point, which is Jerusalem's cry. This is what we read in verse 20. Look, O Lord, for I am in distress. My stomach churns, my heart is wrung within me, because I have been very rebellious. In the street the sword bereaves, in the house it is like death. Well, Why were they crying for God's help? Well, because they were experiencing the consequences of their sin, and because God was using this pain to draw them back to himself. And you see this. God actually uses fire. Look at verse 13. From on high, God sent fire into my bones. He made it descend. He spread a net for my feet. He turned me back. He has left me stunned, faint all the day long. What is God doing? We know this is not the first time that God would send fire. Do you all remember the fiery serpents? from Numbers 21, when God's people were in the wilderness, and they were rebelling. They're like, ah, Moses, why did you bring us out here to die? Let us go back to Egypt. And God sent fiery serpents, and it bit them. And some of them were dying, and they ran to Moses, and they said, we have sinned, we're rebellious. Pray to the Lord that he would get rid of these fiery snakes. Why does God do this? Well, I think it's just like C.S. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts at us in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. What does a child learn after they touch a hot stove? Not going to do that again. Did you know that there is an actual disease that causes people not to feel pain? It's called congenital insensitivity to pain and anhydrosis. CIPA. We'll just call it CIPA from now on. Now, it is extremely rare and also very dangerous. Why? Because what happens if you were at pancake supper the other night and you're talking to me and you put your hand on the griddle and you're like, man, I'm so glad you're putting these pancakes together. If you had CIPA, do you know what you would not realize was going on? You were frying your hand and your hand would be ruined. Do you realize that our culture right now is in experiencing spiritual CIPA? People want to say that fire doesn't hurt. And they look at money. They look at sex. They look at gender. They look at politics. And they say, I can do with these things anything I want. And as a result, all kinds of irreparable damages are taking place. But you see, God doesn't want us to be destroyed No, what the scriptures teach us is he wants us to flourish. Be fruitful and multiply. This is what he says in Ezekiel 33, 11, through the prophet. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that they would turn, return to me, and that they would live. So the question is, is what pain are you experiencing today? Where is God speaking to you as through a megaphone? 
Remember, he does not desire our destruction, but that we would return to him and live. It is not an accident that before Jerusalem called for God's help in verse 20, and this is where I want you to see, I'm not making this up. Before they turned to God and cried for help, verse 20, they turned to somewhere else in verse 19. They turned to their lovers and they said, help. And they said, you've deceived me to their lovers. Why? How so? Well, they promised help that they could not deliver. The same thing happens to us today. We turn to a substance We turn to a relationship. We turn to a politician, a person. We turn to whatever it is. And they don't, they not only don't provide us satisfaction, but they leave us worse off than when we started. That's always the way that it goes. But this is not the case with God. Again, God hears those who cry out to him and he answers their call. Look at, for example, Psalm 145, verse 18. The Lord is near to all who call on him. He fulfills the, the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. Well, who is this God that is so just and yet so loving? Well, I'm glad you asked because that's the third point. This is Jerusalem's God. Look at what we learn about this God in verse Verses 21 through 22. They heard my groaning, yet there is no one to comfort me. All my enemies have heard of my trouble. They are glad that you have done it. You have brought the day you announced. Now let them be as I am. Let all their evil doing come before you and deal with them as you have dealt with me. Note the desire for both comfort and justice. Just as with the rest of the Old Testament, the writer of Lamentations understands that the God of Jerusalem is both a judge and a comforter. This is exactly what the grieving widow sorrowfully expresses throughout Lamentations. When we are in God's judgment and away from his presence, there is no comfort. There is absolutely no comfort. The clear testimony of the Old Testament is that when God appears on the great day of the Lord, it will be judgment for some. And yet it will be comfort for others. Thus Isaiah began his prophecy about the coming Messiah by saying in Isaiah 40 verse 1, Comfort, comfort my people. For this Messiah will show comfort to those who turn to him. And yet judgment to those who don't. Similarly, the prophet Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 37, he says that regardless of how bad things get, the spirit of the Lord will come and resurrect his people. Then comes the New Testament where we find the Apostle Paul expounding on this idea of comfort. And look what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verse 3 through 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. <laughs> you think he's trying to make a point there? This great God of comfort that Paul describes is the same God of judgment in the book of Lamentations when he destroyed the temple and Jerusalem and he kicked them out of the promised land. We must take careful consideration of the fact that Lamentations doesn't move too quickly past sin. And I think that's our temptation, right? Even like when you discipline a child, you want to get quick to the grace, you know. But I don't think it's a good idea to move too quickly past the sin that took place. And I think a lot of Christians are guilty of this. You know, and I, sorry for the reference, but it it came to my mind. You know, it's that Bob Marley song. Don't worry about a thing. Every little thing going to be all right. And so we think to ourselves, well, I can sin. I mean, God's a forgiving God. He's just going to comfort me. We're going to be spending five weeks looking at Lamentations. It's not an accident that the book is here. Because it tells us that this God is the God of comfort. But he is also a God of justice. And he takes sin very seriously. And so we can't rush from sin. No, we need to look at our sin. And we need to repent of it. We need to run far, far away. Just like we would not want a child to soon forget about a stove being hot... Neither does God want us to forget the danger of sin, nor the peril that it exposes us to. There is a tension in lamentations between God's judgment and God's comfort that is not reconciled 
until you get to the cross of Jesus Christ. Now just think about verse 12 in light of Jesus hanging on the cross. Jesus is being crucified. Well, he, he is on the cross. He's being crucified and he's looking at the people. Now listen to verse 12 from Jesus' perspective. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. Y'all, what was God the Father angry about? Our sin. And so get this, God's judgment fell on God the Son so that we could receive God's comfort. Do you see that? The wrath of God fell on Christ so that we could receive his tender mercy. Jesus' cries for help were ignored, remember? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Silence. Jesus' cries were ignored so that our cries could be heard. Do you see this? You know what it makes me think of? I discovered this uh, while researching this passage. Years ago, there was a large mural painted in a very prominent and public area. Christ was at the center, not on a cross, but tied with his hands to a sort of altar. His head was bowed, adorned with a crown of thorns, and his body was bent over in pain and anguish. Nearby was an inscription, Deo Ignoto, which in Latin means to the unknown God. Man, this is powerful, even that. Past him was flowing from one side to the next, a crowd of people who represented modern life. There were men and women in rich dress and poor people in ragged attire. Clergymen engaged in heated theological debate. Men reading newspapers, a priest intoning a prayer, a mother and her child, all sorts of different people. And of all the people, only one looked up at the suffering image of Christ, and she only did it for a shocked and horrid uh, second before she turned away. Now, can you hear verse 12 of Lamentations again? Is it, nothing of, is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? What an apt depiction of our modern culture in its ignorance of Christ. The question we are going to be confronted with during Lent and through our time studying Lamentations are twofold. Number one, do you recognize your sin? Are you ignorant of your sin? And number two, are you ignorant of the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ? To the extent that we recognize our own sin and the danger that it poses to us will be the extent to which we we get out of there. We run and we cling to Jesus Christ. To the degree that we see Christ's great sacrifice for us on the cross will be the the degree to which we sacrificially say, you know what? I'm going to serve you. Let us pray. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Come, Holy Spirit, give us not only ears to hear, but hearts that are fertile to receive your gospel, that you would bear fruits 20-fold, 40-fold, 100-fold, Help us be cognizant of our sin this day and help us flee from it to you that we might flourish and that we might bear much fruit. All to the glory of your name we ask it, Lord Jesus. Amen.